Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Take a Killer to Brunch. We are a true crime and all things spooky podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Darcy. And I am the other co-host, Shannon. And we are so happy to have all of our new listeners and all of our tenured listeners and psych patients alike in this year's psych ward. So we are going to kick off this episode, which is mine. As previously mentioned, both this episode and last episode came out on today's date to make up for last week's faux pas. So if we don't seem overtly in awe or shock, it's because we've recorded those once before and we will be re-reacting basically to the same episode. But if you go to the end or if you listen till the end, you'll get to see a little terrible glimpse of the horror that was the audio faux pas that we had to deal with so i've learned my lesson and we will do test recordings before every episode now (laughs) so we don't have this problem in the future okay yes also i'm very quite sad though that our one that we did together at least didn't make it didn't make the cut because as i've heard from some of my coworkers and friends and stuff we are rather entertaining apparently when we're together and drunk. So not, I wouldn't say we're never drunk recording. Cause that's like another level of Darcy and Shannon that like nobody needs to see besides us. It, but maybe special people, of course, but at least a drinking Shannon and Darcy. That's we're a little, we're a little different, but especially when we're together. So I'm a little sad about that. Cause I find that we are actually very entertaining, but and it's not just me, apparently, <laughs> But maybe yeah. we can do some snippets from there that was from some of our best moments. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, we'll be back in Phoenix soon. So we will be able to re-record or record together again more often than not going forward. So we'll have to get creative with a setup that is accommodating to audio and video and um, everything. So. Oh, yeah. And then we'll, have, we'll make some fun of it, too. It's going to be exciting. Oh my God, I'm so excited for it. Okay, so this week's episode, everybody, is on the the Dr. Thomas Neal Cream because of Gemini season, also known as the Lambeth Poisoner. He is a Gemini and the year of the dog for any of our Chinese Zodiac fans, which I wanted to ask, are you a Chinese Zodiac fan? Am I speaking into the ether with those? I like to think (laughs) that somebody cares, but if you do, let us know like this video or put it in the comments so we know that you do anyway another not so fun fact is he is in the running as one of the potential suspects of being jack the ripper so we have him we also had hh holmes and i'm sure there were other ones but he is one of those people he ran amok across two continents between canada the u.s and england so three countries two continents he was just running wild The methods of murder included poisoning, specifically strychnine. And according to Wikipedia, for anyone who doesn't know what strychnine is, excuse me, strychnine is a highly toxic, uh, colorless, bitter, crystalline alkaloid used as a pesticide, particularly for killing small vertebrates such as birds and rodents. So it's pesticide. It's not meant to be ingested. So that was his preferred method of poisoning. He is known to have killed at least four women, specifically prostitutes, hence why they thought he might be Jack the Ripper. He also killed one man and he had the attempt and he also had an attempted murder and he suspected of killing three other people, possibly more, but he is at least convicted of the four women and a man. He was born May 27th, 1850. And he was the oldest of eight siblings in Glasgow, Scotland. So he was born in Scotland. And by the time he was four years old in 1854, his family would up and move to Quebec, Canada. That's where his father takes a job in a lumberyard and quickly becomes very successful. And so the family, they really weren't hurting for money. They were living the pretty good life. And because of this, Thomas had a bunch of luxury and he was also the favorite. It was very obvious he was the favorite amongst his parents. 
Some examples include that he didn't have to work the lumber yards like his siblings had to. And because he took an interest in medicine and his family was well off with money, his father was so proud. He was like, oh, my son is so smart. He can do whatever he wants. So he decides to pay and send Thomas off to attend McGill, Montreal in 1872 to study medicine where he would go on to graduate with honors on March 31st, 1876. Now, due to being raised with zero discipline and he got whatever he wanted when he, what did I say? He got whatever he wanted and you could say that his worldview was very skewed. He was very misogynistic and this came out heavily once he went off to college. And in case you don't know what being misogynistic or being a misogynist is, it's when someone despises, hates, dislikes, or is strongly prejudiced against women. So tons of good things going for Thomas right now. Another thing to remember about Thomas is that he was a doctor first and foremost, albeit a morally awful doctor. He didn't really care much about his patients. He actually did not go out of his way to help people keep them alive. He really did it only if he absolutely had to. And he pretty much just didn't give a fuck overall. He's like, I don't care. I'm just, I'm really here for the ass and the money. That's all I care about. Another glowing star to note about Thomas's winning personality is that he was also really handsome. So he could get away with a lot of this behavior because he was good looking, he was rich, he was a doctor, and pretty faces get a lot farther in society than just brains alone. And so he got away with a lot of things as well. It was no surprise that women were really smitten with Thomas. And I think it was his top hat. Now, <laughs> there's this podcast I listen to called The Poisoner's Cabinet. If you haven't listened to it by now, please go listen to it. They are so funny. And basically what they do is they talk about different cases throughout history and there's either a signature cocktail that makes its way into the show or they make a signature cocktail about that episode. They had a really great description of him and it was super funny and so I had to put it in here. And they said, they quote, he is your stereotypical Victorian villain. Before he poisoned people, he tied women to railway tracks. So <laughs> that's like how they described him to the world. I think I told you this last time. I just think of the villain from Rocky and Bullwinkle, mm -hmm. the really short dude and the really tall Russian woman. And that's all I can see. <laughs> Literally, though, because it's like you're, you're stereotypical, like you said, like <laughs> the villain. And he is such a villain. Like a he, villain. Plays the, he plays the cards so well. Yeah, he really does. He's just, he was given a silver spoon in life, and he's just been like, everyone owes me something. Like he's uh, like, society owes me whatever I want. Yeah, and it's people like Numi Darcy that literally want to barf to that. Exactly. But anyway, I'll put a photo of him somewhere on the screen so you can see what I'm referencing. But anyway, what I'm getting at is he was attractive and he knew it, obviously, Around this time, Thomas ends up meeting Flora Elizabeth Brooks. She comes from a very wealthy family. Her father was the owner of a successful hotel in Waterloo. And Flora fell head over heels for Thomas. Aw, so sweet. Barf. And she assumed, yeah, she assumed they would go on to get married, live happily ever after, have a great family. You can guess where I'm going with this. That doesn't happen, right? So, while our lovely Flora is uh, helplessly wearing rose-covered glasses and picturing their future together, she's just waiting for him and pressuring him to propose to her, which he had zero intention of doing. He was like, I'm not marrying you. I'm not fucking marrying anybody. Hell not. So, he starts to enjoy the company of ladies of the night, if you will. So when he wasn't with Flora, he was accompanied by prostitutes. And he ultimately had plans to leave for London as soon as he was done with school so he could continue his education at the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons in, at Edinburgh. And obviously he didn't tell Flora about this. 
And as his, I guess, escape date comes closer, it's time for him to flee. Floor comes to Thomas and she's like, I have something to tell you. Do you know what that thing was that she had to tell Thomas? Ooh, let me guess. She is with child. Huh? <laughs> She's with his child, no less. Yes. The scandal. So, like, she's like, Thomas, I'm pregnant. We're going to be a happy family. And Thomas is like, no, I have to leave for London. And you are going to bring shame to me, to yourself, to your father. Do you really want to do this? Is that really something you want to do? You want to bring shame upon all of us because you are being greedy and want a baby? I just wonder, too, though, like, back then, obviously, because it was, like, way different times, what do you think, like, couples could have done in a cute way to try to announce their pregnancy? Because you know how, like, nowadays, like, people have the pregnancy test that says, hey, I peed on this and I'm pregnant, you know, kind of thing. They put it in a box, like, here's my urine, like, covered stick here. I just, I'm curious. I'm trying to think of like a very clever way they could have done it back then. To be like, surprise, we're having a child, but trying to be all cute and shit. I feel like back then it was less like something to be celebrated and more something of like this but, duty as a woman. But also, what if they did though? Like, how would they have done that? I need the people's input too. Know. Like, how yeah, could have somebody way really back then, know. yeah. Can you, how can you have announced in a very cute way to your partner that you're pregnant if you truly meant it? Because, you know, like I said, it's, it's it's nowadays with social media, yes. Nowadays with social media, it's like you can do so many things. Like people like make little baby shirts or they like this, have a mug that says, hey, daddy, or whatever. And yeah, how could they have done it back then? There has to be a yeah. clever way. So if you were pregnant in the Victorian era, how would you announce your pregnancy? <laughs> we would love to know because I am drawing a blank. Yeah. It's cute. Maybe bake it in a loaf of bread or something. I don't know. Not the baby. No, not the baby. No. <laughs> a literal bun in the oven. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean that you... was Dagmar Overby's thing. <laughs> so toss it in. But anyway. So he convinces Flora that he'll perform this abortion, right? He's like, I'm a trained professional. No, he wasn't. He Not only was he a doctor, but he was a shitty surgeon. So you're a shitty surgeon. He's like, I've done this before. I know what I'm doing. He didn't know what he was doing. It was all ego. So he performs this abortion on Flora, which obviously it's illegal because it was illegal at the time. And she miraculously survives. A lot of times when we're talking about cases as old as these, when women get abortions, they generally die, especially back alley abortions. So they generally die. Flora doesn't die. Good for her. But she's not out of the woods yet. <clears throat> While she doesn't die, she would become very ill. Not long. She gets very ill. She has to be bedridden. And she has to finally, like, she has to tell her dad that she doesn't feel well. And her dad is a very protective man. He loves his daughter very much. He wants to protect her in every way, shape, or form. He's very scared that she's really sick. So he calls on the family doctor. The family doctor shows up. It wasn't Thomas, by the way. He was not the family doctor. They had an actual family doctor. So he shows up. He does these tests. And he comes back and he's like, look. Flora has gotten a really bad infection from a botched abortion. Her father flies into a rage. And by flies into a rage, if we're talking about Victorian cartoon villain, he develops an angry mob of pitchforks and fire. And I'm here for it. Oh, we love an angry mob. Yeah, a literal angry mob. Like this one, like that's how liked this guy was in the community. They were like... Yes, we will all go after this one person for you because we like you. I just want to be involved in an angry mob that I actually support, though. Like, I would, I, I would love that. I'd carry the flaming torches. Yeah. I want a pitchfork. <laughs> Give me the fire. Yeah. Anyway, so they hunt, literally, they hunt down Thomas. They scoop up Thomas into the angry mob. The very next day... Flora is standing at the altar with Thomas. 
wow, he had a change of heart. No, he had a gun barrel pushed in the lower of his back by her father to make sure he didn't run away. Because he was like, you're going to get my daughter pregnant. You're going to marry my daughter, right? So he forces Thomas to marry Flora, which like, what a cute wedding. Imagine those wedding photos, right? Do you think the photographer could like, show to Photoshop dad out? <laughs> a gun? You just see like this like curtain that's just like the shape of a gun, like up against Thomas's back. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, he's just nervous. He's super stiff because he's nervous. Yeah, yeah. That's, what's that shiny thing back there? Is that a gun? <laughs> Sparkly dust. Anyway, so they get married, but not even 24 hours after marriage, Thomas is like, bye. And he gets on a boat and he flees to London. So he immediately flees. He is gone. You can imagine her dad doesn't really like him by now. Beauty. Which comes back later in the story. So he flees to London. He pursues his education. And when he wasn't working on his studies, he was, as expected, chasing down the ladies, sleeping with prostitutes. And then also bragging to anyone that would listen about how many prostitutes he slept with and what he could get them to do. Weird flex, bro, but go off. I guess. <laughs> Whatever. It was rumored that he actually got syphilis from one of the women that he had slept with. And Thomas, who was already misogynistic, became even more angry with women because there's no way in his mind that he could foresee or comprehend that any of his actions led to him getting syphilis. Now, this is back in the day, so there were no rules around telling people you had STDs or STIs. She probably didn't even know she had it. And because when you have unprotected sex, things can happen. But he didn't see how any of that was his fault. Absolutely not. Why would it be? He's a doctor. How can he get sick? Yeah. He's the guy. It's always the women's fault, right? Exactly. And women are just out to fuck him exactly. over. Mm. Yeah, it's always the women's fault. Where's your flies water? Anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> so while he's living it up in London, Flora, all the way back in Canada, she's still not getting any better. Thomas would write to her and he would send her all of these little white pills. And in these letters with these pills, he would tell her to only take the pills that he is giving her and not to tell anyone that he's giving them to her because that seems safe, right? No, it's not safe. So she does just that. She doesn't tell anybody. She's taking these white pills. And of course, she gets worse. So she's getting worse and worse to the point where her family doctor is like, okay, I'm actually really scared for you. And so he sits down with Lord and he listens. Are you taking any other medications besides the one I've been prescribing you? And she's, yes, I have. And he's, stop taking them immediately because they're not making you better. They're making you worse. And so she listens to the doctor. She doesn't take any more of the pills or she doesn't get any more pills, whatever. And she starts to make a recovery. So we're rooting for Flora. She's on this up and down roller coaster. And she's like on the up and up. Unfortunately, she would not stay on the up and up for long as she would end up contracting a very severe case of bronchitis and that would eventually kill her. So eventually she does die of her illness and her father was like, I'm not done here. He's like, I'm 100% convinced that Thomas killed my daughter and I want him tried for that. Yeah, I mean, everyone suspected foul play. Yeah, and then the poor girl, like she her immune system was just so shot at that point. So it's like something as simple as bronchitis just did her in. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in that day and age. Oh, yeah. Like tuberculosis was deadly back then, too. Unfortunately, her dad has this investigation done to look into Thomas to connect him to the murder of his daughter. And unfortunately, they have no evidence to pin her death on Thomas because these white pills she was taking, they couldn't find any. So they didn't really have anything and he would never be charged with Flora's death, even though everyone's, yeah, he totally did it. 
with that being said, we can assume Flora is his first victim, but he was never actually convicted of her death. So now we're going to go into his murders. <clears throat> so Thomas is bouncing between the U.S., Canada, and London. So between all of these places, there's deaths involved. I don't really know exactly where all of these took place, so just bear with me. So after Flora's death, Thomas wraps up his studies and returns to Canada in May of 1878, and he sets up shop in London, Ontario, as an illegal abortionist, because that's what all these weird killer doctors do. <laughs> they become back alley abortion doctors, and he is no different. So by the time he has become fascinated, by this time he's become fascinated with chloroform and strychnine, which we've already talked about and then in 1879 he meets kate gardner who is another most likely victim of his but again not officially confirmed but he began to flirt with her they kept it a secret and then one day kate comes to him and she tells him that she's pregnant and thomas is like we can't have that and she's like yeah but i don't want an abortion and then she just goes poof <laughs> disappears into the hat it's the yep hat. It's magic trick <laughs> It's like pulling the bunny out of the hat. You know, just, things can disappear back into it, too. Yeah, you can pull a bunny out of a hat and pull a pregnant woman in. <laughs> there you go. She disappears, but her body would actually go on to be discovered in a shed in a back alley not far from Thomas's practice. So because... And then she would also be discovered with a bottle of chloroform next to her body. But because she was so close to Thomas's practice, naturally Thomas was interviewed and investigated by the police. And he did talk about, about her. He was, and he told them that she had come to him seeking an abortion, but he refused to do the procedure because he's an upstanding citizen. And they start to ask people around, and an anonymous witness goes, yo, listen. Here's the tea on the street. They were dating, right? And they were getting it on. And we're all convinced that her pregnant, her pregnancy, her baby was Thomas's kid. And he, so there you go. <laughs> and so, so you put two and two together and there you go. I know. And because this is 1879, they didn't know about Flora back in Canada or wherever she, they were in Canada, but they didn't know about Flora. And unfortunately, without any evidence to convict Thomas, um, her, her death would announce me to be ruled murdered by persons unknown, is how her death would be. Mm -hmm. So one year later in 1880, Thomas moves his practice to Chicago because he was actually forced to close up shop following the Kate Gardner situation. So he was literally run out of london ontario which you know what mob justice i think serves once again <laughs> they're like no for the time period no. though fuck yeah take justice into your own hands so he leaves and he flees to the u.s and he flees to chicago in 1880 which what do we know from previous episodes the world's fair happens in chicago in 1889 so this kind of also ties into like him being around during the H.H. H. Holmes time, being around during Jack the Ripper time, so how all these things come together, right? But he moves his new shop into the red light district, which, what a convenient place to shut up, set up a back alley abortion clinic. And it's not long for him to get back on top. Yeah. So he's doing really well for himself. He's doing so good. He's living it up that he's, I need an assistant. I need help. So he hires a woman by the name of Hattie Mack. Hattie Mack takes on the job of a midwife. She had been a midwife before, and now she goes to work for Thomas. It's around this time that he's also began partying a lot, and he's taking a lot of drugs, such as cocaine and morphine. So he's getting really high. He's partying all the time. And you can imagine that's probably not going to work out for him in the long run. This means introducing Marianne Faulkner. She's, again, another most likely victim of Thomas, but nothing confirmed. She would die of blood loss from a botched abortion, which Thomas did perform. But Thomas left her in the care of Hattie after the procedure. She slowly died, and 
at Hattie in Hattie's care. And upon her death, Hattie tells Thomas, you know, she died. And Thomas goes to her and I can just, I just see him like totally coked out. And he's, here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do, Hattie. We're going to burn the place down. I <laughs> looks like white dust on his nose. Yeah, I just think of like the um, his like top hats askew. His like hair is just like sticking yeah, out. <laughs> yeah, he's like, we're gonna burn it down. We're just gonna burn the whole fucking place down. And Hattie's like, no, <laughs> we're not gonna burn the place down, Thomas. And so Thomas's response is to just leave. He just walks away. He's like, okay, fine. And he's like, bye. Like he just fucks off, which I am like, okay. And he goes home with yeah. the tie. He's like, he's like um, yes, it's silly idea, silly idea. It's fine. Just kidding. Yeah, and he's just gonna go home and get high. <laughs> like, okay. whatever. Go off, sis. So it's not long after her death that her disappearance really gets to the eyes of the authorities. They come to Thomas, and he's back under review of the law. So there was actually evidence stacked against him this time, but it was determined like him and Hattie would both get arrested until it was determined who was actually responsible for her death. So they're both sitting in jail and Thomas was really inconvenienced about this because he can't get his drugs in jail. He can't kill people while he's in jail. He's just really like this. It's really inconvenient for me. I don't like it. So what does he do? He goes to his lawyer and him and his lawyer, they sway the all-white, all-male jury, because this isn't totally biased, right, that a doctor of his stature would not have botched this procedure, because in the medical world, you can say those definitive answers. <laughs> and it was all Hattie's fault. It was actually Hattie who actually botched the abortion. It wasn't Thomas. And he stated, and I quote, men like themselves had to look out for one another. They needed to protect themselves from rude and vindictive women. The women, the audacity. Uh, the audacity of these women. So it didn't take much to convince this jury that he was innocent and Hattie was the criminal. Hattie Mack would be convicted of her murder and that ultimately she'd be sentenced to death and Thomas would walk free. It also didn't help that Hattie was black. So the all white, all male jury against a black female, they weren't going to rule in her favor anyway, right? So unfortunately, she is sentenced to death and she takes the fall for the murder of Marianne Faulkner. Now we're going to jump forward to December and we have the first confirmed murder of Thomas. We have Ellen Stack. She was 19 years old. She went to Thomas for abortion contraceptive, AKA the abortion pill. Thomas, because this is the 1800s, they don't just have the magic pill ready. He's, I'm going to make you a concoction. So Thomas goes to his lab and explosions and poofs and things. I just think of like Yzma from like the Emperor's New Groove making potions <laughs> and powders. And he concocts his own special abortion pill recipe. He gives it to Ellen and he tells her to take this. Here's your prescription. Off you go. The one special ingredient he added into her abortion pill was a very lethal dose of strychnine. So within one to three hours of her taking this recommended dose, she died a very slow and painful death. Thomas would also be charged and investigated for her murder. But again, his lawyer claimed he must have had a really good lawyer. His lawyer claimed that it wasn't his fault that she died because he didn't make the prescription. It was that of a pharmacist and not his client. So, of course, Thomas walks free and yet again out on the streets. So in 1881, we have Daniel Scott. Daniel was 61 years old. Thomas was also now running a new scam and he was basically selling like magic snake elixir, right? Like he had these pills that he claimed cured epilepsy, yeah. which is really fucked up because there was like no cure for epilepsy. And obviously it was horse shit, but it did catch the attention of the very wealthy Daniel Scott who suffered with epilepsy so bad that it kept him at home. So you can imagine he was like, oh my gosh, if this even half works, I might have a chance at life again, right? 
So he sends his wife, his lovely wife, Julia, to go pick up his prescriptions of these magic pills. If you know where I'm going with this, then you would be correct. Because Julia and Thomas begin having an affair. And so it was easy for her to have this affair because she had to go pick up his medicine, right? So they're having this affair. It lasts for months before her husband finds out. Obviously betrayed and enraged, he demanded that Julia break off the affair with Thomas. And Thomas doesn't take this lightly. He's, I'm sorry, who the fuck are you? And so he's, we're not going to stop having this affair. So Daniel makes a fatal mistake. And after he basically pisses off Thomas, he still takes medication from him. And if you know where this is going, Thomas is, here's your special concoction, which also had a very lethal dose of strychnine in it. Naturally, his death was ruled a death due to epilepsy. Thomas was not having any of that because Thomas is narcissistic. He wants to take credit for his work, even if he lies and gets off scot-free. So does he, he does the very logical thing. He lies about it and he threatens people. <laughs> what do you mean? Let me tell you what I mean. He was really like obsessed. He got, and I think it's the drugs that he was taking. He got really obsessed with just sending letters to random people and threatening them that he knew that they were the ones responsible for this person's death or that person's death. And he had all this information and he was going to go tell the police unless they sent him money to keep him quiet. That's like some coke induced paranoia right there. Or not paranoia, but like psychosis. Hey. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, what are you ding dong ditching? What is this? <laughs> Okay. I, I, they didn't have doorbells works. back then, so it was like maybe that was so his version of like being dog dishing. Letter writing. What would that be called if someone was going to like, what do you call ding dong ditching <laughs> in your mailbox? <laughs> Ooh, I don't know. I don't, yes. have an <laughs> I don't know. So, to so get even better, right? Thomas is not satisfied still, so he contacts the coroner. And he tells the coroner that he felt that the pharmacist who gave Daniel his last set of epilepsy medication put too much strychnine in Daniel's pills, which the coroner found really odd, seeing as the death was ruled something totally different. And in the po when the postmortem was done, they found that there was enough strychnine in Daniel's system to kill him three times over. And they were like, this is really weird because we actually never release that information to the public. So how did this guy know that there was strychnine in this man's medication? So naturally, everyone's, maybe we should look into this guy. <laughs> Seems suspicious, which they do. <clears throat> so instead of charging the pharmacist, they actually arrest Thomas. This time, Thomas would knock it off scot-free. He goes to trial. And he's all prepared to blame somebody else until he sees no one other than Julia take the motherfucking stand. Julia was terrified to be there because she was really afraid that Thomas was going to kill her. But she testified against him and she confirmed all these things and Thomas would eventually get convicted. He would actually be sentenced to life in prison. Yay! Unfortunately, it's not the end of the story. Oh, I was about to be sad. I was about so, to be so happy. You know. <laughs> yeah. No. Nope. So he gets sentenced to life in prison, but apparently in what 1881, I think this is. Yeah, in 1881, you can get sentenced to life in prison, but after serving 10 years, he's actually released on executive clemency, aka he was basically pardoned. But how? Sure. I didn't really, that's not in my notes. I don't know how he got pardoned. Because he was a pardoned. I think it probably had something to do. Because he was a white man. What? Probably, but I think it had something to do with his wealthy family had money and they probably yeah. knew people in government and they probably pleaded and begged and they probably yeah. bought his freedom. So he's a white guy. That's what I think. And because he's a white man. So he gets set free. Like I said, Julia was terrified of him. Julia fucking flees. She goes into hiding 
and she does it really well. She does it so well that even when he hired the Pinkertons, the Oinkerton, like to call them. Um, yes, we love them. I think we should do just like a yes. side episode. Yes, and I love my how my typo has evolved into this whole nickname for the Pinkertons because I don't know why. My finger just kept wanting to touch the O instead of the P, which is right next to each other. So they were the Oinkertons. The Oinkertons. Because the Pinkertons are the ones that caught H.H. H. Holmes. They were in your episode as well. So <clears throat> they're just popping up everywhere. He hires them and they can't find her. So they can't even find Julia, luckily, because that probably saves her life. And eventually he has to give up. And that really makes him mad because he doesn't like being outdone. But he was outdone. So after all of this happens in Chicago, he's like, yo, I probably shouldn't be here anymore. So he up and leaves again back to London again. It's now October 13th, and we have Ellen, who was also known as Nellie Donworth. She was also 19 years old. She's another victim of Thomas's. He would be, he charmed Ellen into having drinks with him. And after a few hours, Ellen is stumbling out of the bar and a friend of hers sees her and he, and not he, but that friend, I don't know if it was a man or woman, but that friend actually helps her home. Later on, Ellen tells her landlady that she had accepted a drink from a doctor while there was with a white dust on it. So not sure why she still drank it. I wonder if she thought that it was drugs it was, but not the party kind, to be fair. Mm -hmm. This is your guys' reminder to not drink drinks from people. Just watch, make sure people, you watch them or you make your own drink, okay? Okay, PSA over. Unfortunately, she would go to her room and she would begin to convulse and she was in horrible pain. And unfortunately, she does die before the paramedics got to her, got her to the hospital. And it was discovered that she had a large dose of strychnine. Ooh, so shocked. So, so only, so shocked. So only one week later, we have Matilda Clover, who was 27 years old and another victim of Thomas. A week, like I said, a week after Ellen's death, Matilda arranged to meet a regular client of hers who was named Fred. She goes to meet Fred. But after they finish, he gave her some pills that he said helped would cure her VD. If you don't know what VD is, venereal disease, he's like, here you go, take some pills. I think this one's a little different because he knew her. Like, he was a regular client of hers, so they had some rapport. They had some trust. So I can understand why she would feel like she could trust his medication. She knew he was a doctor, and she's like, just so kind. Thank you so much. God damn it, Matilda. No, sweetie. No. So, unfortunately, her housemates would be awoken by her agonizing screams. She was a single mother, and she would be found covered in vomit, convulsing, foaming at the mouth before ultimately dying, and her death was ruled an alcohol overdose. And if those of you don't know, that's not how that works but anyway the autopsy was never performed fred who was probably thomas himself was never pursued because she was a lady of the night so they're not going to exhaust resources to investigate the deaths of prostitutes it's just not going to be a thing that happens in london in 1881 so in 1882 on april 2nd there's lou harvey Thomas met her and convinced her to share a drink with him before they attended a show at the music hall. He told Lou that, that he had something that could fix her acne and make her complexion better. Gee, thank you so much. What a way to compliment a woman on a date by telling her, you're really <laughs> ugly with acne, but I can make it better. Let me just give you some pills that will fix What a pickup line. What a pickup line. And... They're on their way. I know, right? What a smooth talker. So they're on their way to this music hall, and he gets her these pills, and he's like, but you have to take these, like, right now. 
Like, you have to take these before we go into the theater. And she's like, what the fuck? Like, why? But he was really persistent about her taking these pills. And she's, like, really uncomfortable. And they're walking next to the River Thames. Thomas is continuously pressuring her to take these pills. So what does she do? She decides that she's not going to trust him. Because at this point in history, Jack the Ripper is running amok all throughout London. And she's like, I don't know. He seems kind of sus. So she pretends to take the pills. She totally does the whole fun swipe. And he is convinced enough that he thinks that she took them. And he tells her, oh, my gosh, I am so sorry. I totally forgot to go check up on a patient at the hospital. I have to go right now. But I will be back to walk you home after the musical the musical performance. It was 11 p.m. I don't think there was any patients he needed to check up on at the hospital, but he left. And so she was like, okay. And the second he was out of her sight, she chucked the pills into the River Thames. So Lou was our survivor. So we were very proud of her. She didn't take the pills, the magic white pills of death. And she just moves on with her life. On April 11th, Alice Marsh, who was 21, and Emma Shrevel, who was 18, they introduce he introduces himself to these women as Fred. <laughs> so Fred's back in the picture. And they proposition he propositioned both of them for the night. So they all went back to their apartment where they shared a delightful dinner of canned Ugh. salmon and Guinness. The combo though, the combo. <laughs> How? No. All knows. I don't know, man. Hell nah. I don't know, man. It's It's so classy. Sounds great. They shared canned salmon and Guinness. I know, right? And then after that, they do some (laughs) hanky-panky twister (laughs) dance going on. They play a game Um, of Make a Twister. And yeah, exactly. And so he's, like, getting ready. He's, like, dressing up. And he's like, hey, before I leave, thank you so much for a great evening. Here's some pills. These are cure your VD, right? Now, I don't know if he knew these women had VD or if he just assumed they had VD because he's just giving out pills for VD left and right. They're like, oh, my God, thank you so much. So he leaves. Oh, the things I could say. (laughs) So he leaves. And they're like, oh, my God, literally a nice guy. And so, like, they totally take these pills. And they're like, this is a bad idea. They start convulsing. They're vomiting. They're foaming at the mouth. The landlady is like, what the fuck is going on? She comes in. She's like, oh, my God. So she calls the police. But by the time they get there, the woman had died before they could even get to the hospital. And at this point, the police were like, huh, I think there's another serial killer on the loose besides Jack the Ripper. (laughs) Yay, London. So, we're rounding down to what what inevitably is going to get Thomas captured. Thoughts? Just thoughts before we talk about his capture. Oh, but when he is captured, does he say captured? At least. All right, then I will be satisfied no matter what, because... It seems like he just seems to be continuously getting away with everything he does. So it's just that final, I don't care how it happens, but he needs to get his, the justice thrown at him. Yep. His comeuppance. He does. So, and it's going to come to you in a way you never saw coming. Anyway, so it's not surprising that Thomas is like on a high. He's on cloud down. He's, I can do anything. Nobody can take me down except the one person that will take Thomas down is none other than (laughs) himself. He inevitably is his own undoing, which is so great. How? I'll tell you. So the police have put together a task force to now hunt the Lambeth Poisoner. That's how he got his name. And while they were ramping up, he was boasting to anyone who would listen, just like he did in college with the prostitutes, at every social event that he went to. He was telling them about um, how he knew two of the victims that had been murdered. He was showing people his extensive porn collection, which I'm like, why are you... Also, what does porn like back then look like, Um, though? 
I want to know. Is it like pictures? Does he have no? Like so it's like pictures? illustrations, like hand drawings, you know, or the actual photographs. Like, I, I, I just, I'm very curious. I'm sure we can Google it. Yeah, I want to know how he was transporting these. Was like <laughs> that's like one of those flip down, like drop down ones. I just like, okay, <laughs> <through the years. laughs> like, like, like this one down here, here you know, like, down oh, this one down here. Like, <laughs> She's real flexible. That one's she. I don't know how she does it, but I don't. He's so. I feel like he's so drug fueled paranoia because he's like saying how he knows the victims. He's ding dong ditching mailboxes with threatening letters. He's showing people his porn collection. He's the logic out to everybody. I don't know what. Yeah, the logic is gone. Running literally gone. At this point, he's. I can literally do yeah. whatever I want. Look at what happened, though. Like we, they created that monster. Yeah. So it's not just his porn collection. He's also, as he did, bragging about the prostitutes that he slept with. So that people were like, okay, like this is really weird. And at this point in his life, to make it even worse, he's. He's no longer this dashing young lad that he used to be. He is now bald. He has a wonky eye. And he, Justice. And he dressed like a Victorian villain. So he's this weird, old, gross-looking dude carrying around porn. I mean, <laughs> Thomas ends up somehow meeting a man by the name of John Haynes. Who is John Haynes? I will tell you. He joined the Scotland Yard to help hunt down the Lambeth Poisoner because he was a detective. When Thomas hears about this, he's, oh, and he becomes intrigued. So he starts talking to this guy about the cases and the murders and the different series, and they talk about the details of the case. And then one thing that really catches John's attention, and he's like, what? So he's, because some of the details that they were talking about were never released to the public, and he's like, okay, this is weird. And then he tells John about Lou Harvey, the girl who didn't die. And he says, he's like, who the hell is Lou Harvey? I don't know what, who you're talking about. And Thomas is like, oh, I know something that you don't know. Instead of being like, wait, why don't you know? He was like, <laughs> me. So he's, oh, he takes the detective to the River Thames where he thought Lou died because of the poison that he gave her, which she didn't take. And he asks Thomas, he's where did where did she die? And he tells her, "Oh, she died at the Oxford Theater." Why he took her to the why he took him to the river to say she died at the Oxford Theater? I don't understand, but whatever. And so he's like, okay. So after his encounter, he's like, "That guy is fucking the guy." <laughs> There's no doubt about it. So he goes to Scotland Yard. He's like that dude. So the authorities immediately start tailing Thomas, and at the same time, they request his records from chicago so now they're pulling records and of his so now all the pieces are coming together and on june Ooh. and in june of 1892 thomas was arrested and he's charged with the premeditated murder and attempted murder thomas was berated by the public but he honestly didn't give a shit none of that faced him he was convinced he was going to get away with these murders like he had time and time again until Lou Harvey takes the stand. So Julia fucked him up in the first one, and now we have Lou Harvey, and he's, oh shit, <laughs> you're not dead. And I told this detective you were dead. Yeah. So she takes a stand, and she clearly laid out the really odd sequence of events of that whole evening. And then she was like, and he didn't come back to the theater like he said he would. I could just, I could just see him in the chair just like. Oh, wait. With the one eye? <laughs> you know. He's just like trying to yes. suck himself into his top hat. Just <laughs> so, <laughs> so good. Yeah. You can sit so many things inside so, of it, though. Um, she's telling them about the pills that he gave her, how he was insistent <laughs> that she take these pills, that he would meet her at the theater, which he never did. And her testimony ultimately was like the damning piece of evidence they needed and it only took the jury 10 whole minutes to come back with a guilty verdict so thomas neil cream was sentenced to death by hanging on november 16th at newgate prison 
His final words before the floors opened beneath him and he swung were, and I quote, I am Jack. Yeah. Um, he wasn't. I don't know. I don't think he was, though. Biggest evidence proving that he wasn't Jack the Ripper is he was actually in jail during the time that Jack was running around. And he, it, but he is on the suspect list, but he was in prison during some of Jack's crimes. So it's not possible for him to be Jack the Ripper, but whatever. Theories and conspiracy theories will forever float the world. So before I say my sources, final thoughts. That was Dr. Neil or Thomas Neil Cream. <laughs> it's frustrating that he was able to get as far as he did, truly. It should have, it, there are so many opportunities to stop this man that it's unreal, truly. But sure, eventually he got his justice, but I don't know. It's a little frustrating. In the 18, the early 1880s, that's probably as good as justice was going to get, especially back then when you didn't have like databases to track people. Um, but it was a wild story. <laughs> And just the weird drugged up shit that he did was just made the story so wild. Yeah. And it's like, you can go from a, an attractive man to having a fucking wonky eye. That's what drugs will do to you. Protect yourselves. That's what drugs, don't do drugs, kid. Also, don't get syphilis and all those other things too, because I'm sure that didn't help. You know, and there was like a, there's a, that thing too, is like when they say when syphilis progresses too, it does cause basically like psychosis so you wonder like, i wouldn't be surprised um, could that have been a factor sure towards him. his I mailbox ding dong ditching he was doing ego would be too big for him to like, go see another doctor to get it treated so he probably didn't treat it but i have nothing to say if he did or didn't yeah truly though like i don't know how like long that takes for syphilis to progress to that level truly so i don't know because obviously that's not really a thing nowadays for people to get <laughs> thank god but anyways, yeah, drugs and all the things he did, just, I don't know. He's a wild one. And the simple fact that the traveling and all this stuff, and then it's almost like towards the end, he just wanted the fame more than anything. Like He didn't care that he was going to get caught and do all these things, and obviously he was going to die. Like, to the end, he just, was he Jack the Ripper, you know, that kind of shit. Like, he just wanted his name out there. So... My sources were Murderpedia, Casebook.org, Canada's, and I also listened to the podcast Serial Killers, The Poisoner's Cabinet, mm -hmm. Muriel's Murders, um, and that is what I have. So thank you guys so much for listening. You can check us out on social media at TAKTB Podcast on Instagram, Ticket Killer to Brunch on Facebook, and if you're listening but not watching on YouTube, you can also find us on YouTube. But you can also send us an email at this episode. There'll be other ones you can check out from us to see what's going on. And if you guys enjoy that, we will see you on the next one. Cheers. Cheers. A little Disney film that's, if it's princesses, it's definitely Snow White. If it's a film, oh, I think it was, uh, oh my God, I'm blinking, the Willy, like, the single Willy. Ah, that's my guess. Equally.